raised to the power n. Uh, various normalizations here. Uh, actually, I want to put a zero here also, which again means that phi vanishes on the boundary. So, so if uh, n is equal to 1, this is the integral of, uh, if n is equal to 1, it's the integral minus phi Laplacian of phi, which then, by integration by parts, since it vanishes on the boundary, is equal to this. It's the energy. But in higher dimensions, when you use the mont Champagne energy, you have to assume that the function here is plurisubharmonic in order for this to be reasonable, because you want this expression here to be positive. So it's important that it be plurisubharmonic. And then you can ask the following question. Let me see if it's time to ask the question. Yeah, it is a question. <laughs> so, problem. What question? Do we, uh, does the Polyasega theorem hold for mont Ampere energy? So is it true that, uh, in, uh, well, the energy omega phi is that greater than the energy over the ball of the same volume of phi hat? Do you have such an inequality for, for the Schwartz symmetrization? In particular, you need for this in order for the question to be reasonable, you want your functions to be plurisubharmonic. So one thing you need is that uh, phi hat is also plurisubharmonic. That's important for the problem to make sense. And unfortunately, this is not true. So it, uh, the project somehow stops here at least for a while, it doesn't really make sense because it's not pure subharmonic anymore. But we add an extra hypothesis. So add hypothesis. <coughs> Namely that phi is S1 invariant. And that means now, by definition, it's going to mean that phi of e to the i theta of c is equal to phi of c when theta lies on S1. So this ha somehow eliminates the problem completely in one complex variable because if you have S1 invariance, it is already radial, so of course the problem is clear. But if you are in higher dimensions, then just one symmetry is not so much. And so you still have a lot of degrees of freedom, and you can ask the problem for such functions there. And then you can say something. So that's the, the first thing is that the problem makes sense. Ah, assume also that uh, you need to assume something about the domain. So assume omega is balanced. And that means for me right now that if lambda is a complex number smaller than 1, then it should imply ah. And if uh, c lies in omega, then I want uh, lambda c to lie in omega. So it's a little bit stronger than saying just that it's S1 invariant. It's it, it also complete in a way. So it particularly contains the origin and things like that. And then we have the first theorem then. Theorem. It says that if phi S1 invariant and uh, omega balanced, for instance a ball, implies that uh, phi hat is uh, plurisubharmonic. So the radial uh, Schwartz symmetrization is still plurisubharmonic. <coughs> and so the problem makes sense. <coughs> so that's uh, theorem one. I'm going to say something about the proofs here later. Uh, actually, I think I'm almost going to give the proofs, but let me give you the other result also then. Theorem two, then, so about the poly. Give us an idea why we might even have expected that to be true, especially since plurisubharmonics this condition on planes. And yes, and it, and it gets complete. It gets completely distorted, right? Uh, right. So, uh, no, I can only say that you wanted it to be true, and then you checked if it were true. Actually, there is a counterpart which I think is known, and that is that if you take a convex function in R n 
and you take the Schwartz symmetrization, then it is still convex. Uh, I haven't really exactly found that statement, but I found a corresponding statement for, for, for convex sets in the book by Bondesen and Fenchel, so, and that's more or less equivalent, I think. I should say that uh, this statement for convex functions is it, based on Brun Minkowski inequality. And this will also, in the complex setting, it will also depend on the version of Brun Minkowski theory. Well, and then anyway, then we get back to the question there about the energy. And then you have that, then uh, I can write it like this that the answer to question is yes, if and only if. It's not always yes, but it depends on the domain. So it is yes if and only if omega is an ellipsoid. So in particular it's true for the ball, uh, which is not trivial. You might think it's trivial since it's already, but the function is not radial. So, so if you take a, any plurisubharmonic function in the ball and you symmetrize it's still plurisubharmonic and the energy goes down, like, just like in the polyan theorem. But you cannot say this about any domain. Actually, actually it's true if and only if the domain is an ellipsoid. That's the main theorem. Okay, before I go on here and indicate the proofs, I would like to just give one little interlude here, which I find intriguing about theorem one here, that pluris harmonicity is preserved. So that's a, just a remark, <coughs> which is uh, the following. It's connected with uh, the openness conjecture remark. Oh, uh, so, so, so let me recall the openness conjecture in complex analysis for pluris of harmonic functions. <coughs> it was formulated by Demergy and Collard. Uh, and it says the following, if uh, let phi be pluris of harmonic, say, in the ball, in the ball, say, not so important exactly the domain there, and be such that integral over the ball e to the minus phi is finite. So it, uh, you, you should think of it as singular as the or at the origin, but uh, this is a measure of how singular it can be. The e to, e to the minus phi is still finite. Then the openness conjecture, so that's the problem, still open. Uh, <coughs> there is an r greater than 1 such that if you look at uh, this integral, so you make it a little bit more singular, this thing, or the ball, and then it's still finite. That's the problem. So this is uh, it's a very elementary problem, but it's been open for like 15 years or so, and I don't know exactly. So <laughs> sort of, <coughs> it was proved in the case of n equal to 2 by uh, Charles Favre and Matthias Jonsson. So the only remark here, just to illustrate the theorem here, is that <coughs> the corollary of the theorem is that if the answer is yes if the function phi is S1 invariant. It still doesn't make the problem uh, completely evident that it's S1 invariant, because again, it's just one symmetry, and you, have a, you can have a lot of variables here. In particular, functions that are associated to metrics on line bundles of a preactive space that will have this thing here. You can apply it to them. So the proof here is uh, so easy that I think I would like to give it. <coughs> it's always good to give a real easy proof to, to uh, inspire a sentiment of security in the audience. So, uh, so let's see that. So the proof is just this, that integral e to the minus phi finite implies that integral e to the minus phi hat is finite, because they are the same. They are equidistributed. And now you can check the openness conjecture for radial functions. And that's a completely elementary exercise of convex functions. So it implies that there is some r such that e to the minus r phi hat is finite. That's, I'm not going to do that, it's very elementary. And then, since they are equidistributed, <coughs> this is the same as integral e to the minus r phi, so it's finite also, and that uh, ends the proof. Though. So uh, it's very easy uh, in that case, and of course it would be nice if one could somehow 
uh, by some finagling get the end result this way, but I don't know how. So I leave it to you to that's a problem to get the general result from there. Okay, so now I'm going to say something about the proof of theorem 1. Let's see what that. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So it uses a proposition, and this is where Bergman kernels appear. So the proposition is the following: <coughs> Let D be a subset of C n plus one, and say it's pseudo-convex. The convex. And you look at the slices. D tau uh, is the set of all C in Cn such that tau C lies in D. Uh, so it's going to look something like this. Here's the tau axis. Here is the Cn axis. And here is a the convex domain D, and you look at the slices like this. Uh, assume now that these functions are S1 invariant. Well, assume, yeah. Assume they are balanced, say. But, well, say D to, yeah, <laughs> D to balanced. Basically S1 invariant and connected, that's what I want. Then, <coughs> Uh, proposition says that the logarithm of the volume of D tau uh, is uh, superharmonic. So, so the map that sends tau to this is superharmonic. So, in particular, if it's independent of the imaginary part of tau, it's concave. So, concave. If uh, independent of imaginary part of tau. <coughs> so that's the theorem. And this you should compare to the Brun Minkowski theorem. So compare Brun Minkowski. So one way to formulate the Brun Minkowski theorem is to say exactly the same thing in Rn, but this is convex then instead. You take the slices, and then there's no assumption on S1 invariant or anything, and the, conc the conclusion is that this function is concave then. So this is, if you want to, is a complex version of the Brun Minkowski inequality for pseudo convex sets in, in CM. <coughs> Now the proof of this, it rests on a property of Bagman kernels that I'm not going to get into, but uh, so the starting point is a theory in my mind from a couple of years ago, which says that if you let a uh, k tau uh, or say of zero be the Bergman kernel, for uh, d tau, at the point zero, at the origin. The origin is inside of D tau. Then logarithm of k tau zero is subharmonic. Subharmonic. So that's the theorem that I'm not going to prove. We're going to use this that the variation of Bergman kernels are subharmonic in the parameter there. Uh, so this rests on uh, L2 estimates and D-bar operators and such things. Uh, so, you need, uh, so you have that. And then, b because of the symmetry, so D tau balanced implies that you can actually easily compute the Bergman kernel. And you find that it is 
equal to 1 over the volume of Dito. Because uh, the Bachmann kernel is a uh, holomorphic function with the reproducing property for zero and the constant, this uh, by the mean value property or for an S1 invariant set, the constant is such a reproducing holomorphic function, so it must be the Bergman kernel. So that ends the proof when you know the fact about the Bergman kernel in general. So that's it. So this we have, that the slices here, the volumes of those <laughs> are super harmonic, and for us they will be concave then if they, if they don't depend on uh, the imaginary part. Okay, now you can look at proof of theorem one then. For theorem one, Remember that the defining property of uh, the Schwartz symmetrization was that you had to look at the set where phi, ah, we say that phi hat was going to be radial. So now I say it's a function of, not of C, but of logarithm of modulus of C. It's more convenient. So the defining property was that the set where phi hat uh, smaller than T was going to be equal to the measure of this, was going to be equal to the measure of the set where phi was smaller than t. Now, this is equal to, uh, uh, yeah, f is going to be increasing. You can assume it's strictly increasing. So this is going to be equal to the set where, where c, where mod c is smaller than uh, e to the f inverse of t. This is the same thing as that. <coughs> so this just says that f of log c is smaller than that. You take the inverse of this increasing function, and you get the f inverse there. And then you take the exponential, you get this. And you can compute this. This is the volume of a ball. So it's equal to some constant, e to the n times f inverse of t. That's what it is. Now, this is equal to the set where phi minus the real part of tau is smaller than zero. Uh, well, the set of C such that this holds. So if you let the set of all tau and C such that uh, phi minus real part of tau less than zero, if you call that D, this is a pseudo-convex set. I can apply the theorem over the proposition over there, and this is a slice of that, those sets. And I find that the I find that uh, uh, yeah. so 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 the proposition implies that the logarithm of the volume here, of the volume where phi hat is smaller than t, is concave. So it says exactly that f inverse is concave. So f inverse is concave. And then it means that f is convex. f convex, you take the inverse. And so if f is convex of log c, this is uh, precisely the condition that this function is plural subharmonic. And, uh, and then we're done. That's zero. OK, so that was the first part here. And then, uh, now, let's see uh, how you estimate the energy. So uh, that's theorem two, the inequalities for the energies. And that is, that uses the method of geodesics. So uh, <coughs> let me say something about that. It uses. <coughs> Uh, now, so, so, so for theorem two. Proof of theorem two. So, you, so you, uh, we let phi, ah, and, and I take then first, there are several directions, there are two directions. So let, uh, first we take uh, omega to be the ball. Omega to be a ball. So then we want to prove that the theorem is true, that the energy goes down. And now <laughs> we let phi be a function then, which is pure subharmonic, vanishing on the boundary of, of the ball. 
And now I'm going to compare it to another function for which I know that the theorem is true. So I take another function, uh, phi zero, which is also going to be in there. So this is an auxiliary function. And it's going to satisfy that uh, phi zero is some function. It, it, it is already radial. So it's, it's its own short symmetrization. <coughs> phi zero is equal to phi zero hat. So the theorem is certainly OK for phi zero. And I want to prove that it's OK for phi. And I connect them now with the geodesic. So connect with the geodesic. So we let phi equal to phi 1 and connect with geodesic. So I'm using. Uh, uh, abuse of language here. So there is a well-established uh, notion of geodesics in the space of smooth, strictly plural subharmonic function. Goes back to uh, Mabuchi, Samson, Donaldson, well in the setting of manifolds and metrics on line bundles. Uh, I'm going to use it a little bit more sloppily here. So I'm going to say that it's a geodesic. It means that I have phi t. Uh, I have phi t of c. They are all the time going to lie in the same space. And uh, the, uh, the, the geodesic condition is that phi of, if I let it, if I think of it as depending on a complex parameter but independent of the imaginary part, this function here is a function of, uh, uh, I could write it as capital phi of tau and c, is, uh, it, should, it should be plurisubharmonic with respect to all the variables. And that's not a geodesic equation because it's just some inequality. But it should set the geodesic equation then is that the Monge pair with respect to all of the variables of capital phi equals zero. So by pluripotential theory, it's enough that you can, uh, if the function is bounded or something like that, it's enough to define this and you can give a sense to this. Even though it's a little bit abusing, it's not quite properly a geodesic. But that's what I want to do. And you can always, by some soup construction, you can always connect uh, uh, those functions with the geodesic in this way. Yeah. It's a theorem of Chen in the complex setting that says that you have some regularity up to almost uh, the second derivatives. But it, it's, it's not so important here. So we can uh, just take it in a generalized sense. So I connect them there. And then I look at, ah, th uh, uh, then we need a lemma first. So I'm going to look at the energy along the geodesic. Uh, and then it's a, it's a known fact, ba basically known, that the energy of phi t is an affine function. It's affine. So the energy uh, depends very nicely on variations. And now it, uh, we can, uh, we take for each fixed uh, value of t there, we, we, we look at, uh, I'll write that as a lemma, we can look at the short symmetrization. So they are all, as we know, plurisub. Uh, yeah, they're going to be S1, uh, S1 symmetric. So uh, phi is S1 symmetric, and then the geodesic is going to be complete all the time S1 symmetric. So those are plurisubharmonic all the time. And we know, actually, uh, it's a sub -geodesic. That's maybe my own word. Uh, so it means that only the first part here, that, that uh, phi hat, well, <coughs> of real part of tau and c is plurisubharmonic with respect to all the variables. No more Schampar equation, it's just the inequality. So that's the cousin of this theorem. Uh, you prove it more or less the same way. <coughs> it's a little bit more complicated, but basically you can verify that. And then it follows from this and known fact of the energy functional that if you look at the energy of phi hat of t, it's concave. So then uh, things start to look good because you have a concave function and you have an affine function and you want to prove some inequality between them. So uh, we're not quite done yet. 
important, but uh, this is the important thing. Well, the first important thing that you have this. <coughs> so let's see. So it looks like this. Let me draw a graph. Here is the t-axis. Here is the energy. And here is the, this is the energy of phi t. <coughs> and for t equal to zero, they are the same since it was already radial. So you have a concave function. It looks something like, maybe like this, or maybe like that. Uh, that would be E of phi t hat. The question is, uh, which of those uh, pictures are, uh, is the right one, so to speak? You want to have an inequality there. <coughs> and the final lemma that does the trick is that Uh, the derivative of e phi t <coughs> at t equal to zero is the same thing as the derivative t equal to zero of e of phi t hat. They have the same derivative. And then, of course, we are in that picture there, in this picture. and. Uh, this was not correct, and uh, so theorem follows. <coughs> so, so how do you prove that's the last part then to see that the derivatives are the same? That's what you need to prove, and that's uh, where the ball is important. It's important that it is precisely the ball. So let's see how you can prove this. That's actually the punchline of the proof. So let's see why. <coughs> well, you know how to compute derivatives of energy functional. So we know that modulo regularity and some technicalities, you know that the derivative of e to the, of e of phi t at t equal to zero is equal to minus, well, it's actually an n plus one here, phi dot zero, mon champere of phi zero over the ball. That's a, that's a classical formula for the derivative of the mon champere energy. <coughs> and then, by the same token, you have the same thing <coughs> of the energy of phi t hat, but with Dot. Dot is the t derivative at zero, and you still have the mon pair of phi zero over the ball. And you want to prove that they. Uh, hat is the Schwartz. Uh, so, so this is the. Uh, yeah, but uh, at the point zero, uh, it was already radial, so it is its own Schwartz symmetrization. But still, so th those two are the same, but those two are not the same. So how do you know that the two integrals are, are equal? Well, that's a funny thing, that's, which turns out to be it's a very trivial thing, but it's actually the, the heart of the matter, it turns out, uh, very surprisingly, at least to me. And, and that's the following observation, that uh, uh, <coughs> if you look at the Mont Jampère of phi zero, uh, which is a radial function. This is radial. It's a, it's a radial function times. The Mont Champere of a radial function is a radial thing. So uh, let that sink in. I mean, this is completely obvious that if you take something that depends only on the radius and you take Mont Champere, that function is still a radial function. So it means that it is equal to some function of phi zero for some, uh, some f. Some f. Because uh, if it is radial, it's a, it's a function of phi zero also. Okay. So it satisfies some sort of equation like this. Okay, and uh, then by the fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, this f has a primitive function, g prime. <laughs> and now you can plug it in here, and you see that, uh, well, this is equal to uh, 
well, let me write it here, d dt of the integral, or d dt of the energy of e of phi t, t equal to zero, is equal to, uh, well, minus n plus one integral phi t, and then you have g prime of phi t. This is f of phi t, uh, sorry, zero there. And here is zero also. g prime of that is f of this, which is the motion person. So this is basically, it's equal to minus n plus one times the derivative of uh, integral g of phi t at t equal to zero. Now you use the defining property of Schwartz symmetrization again. That this is the, since this is some function of phi t, this is the same thing as the derivative. I can replace phi t now by the Schwartz symmetrization. Uh, well, still minus n plus one d dt of uh, integral g of phi t hat, because those integrals are the same for any function; they are the same. And then this is the derivative of. of E of phi t hat. And so they are, uh, and that finishes the proof then. <coughs> so let me say something about why this holds only for the ball then. It turns out that it is this, it, it all centers around this observation. Equations of that form. So I'll say something about that. <coughs> If you imagine that you try to prove the theorem for another, uh, another domain, so let omega be a general balanced domain. Balanced. No, not necessarily the ball. Uh, you want to prove, you want to try to prove an inequality like this over there for the, for the energy. Uh, then you would need to uh, vary not only the function phi of t, but uh, also the domain, which is a bit complicated. So I don't want to do that. So I want to reformulate the problem so that it becomes a problem only for omega. So uh, we can write it like this, that omega, since it is balanced, omega, you can think of it as a unit ball of something. Unit ball of, uh, for some norm, of norm uh, n omega of c. Since it's a balanced thing, uh, you can think of it as a norm of something. It's not convex anymore, so it's not a proper norm, but it's only plurisubharmonic. But I put quotes there. And you let, uh, and now I, t I, I define a sort of a green function by taking the logarithm of that. So I let u, u or omega be equal to the logarithm of the norm. <coughs> so that's it. Uh, so that would be equal to, in the case of the ball, it would be a my substitute for log mod c. Now I define <coughs> define uh, omega symmetrization, not Schwartz symmetrization, but omega symmetrization of phi. If I take a function phi, say pluris harmonic or something, in in omega. I define the omega symmetrization by, uh, uh, I call it S omega of phi. It's going to be equal to uh, uh, a function, not of log c, but of uh, a function of u omega instead. And it should still be equidistributed with phi. equidistributed with phi. So I can define a symmetrization with respect to any domain like this by replacing logarithm of c by this function u that comes from the associated norm. <coughs> okay, so that's my Schwartz symmetrization. And then it's an easy exercise to see that it has the same energy, uh, uh, that's the omega symmetrization. And it's an easy exercise to see that it has the same energy as the Schwartz symmetrization. So then uh, E omega, S omega 
for phi is equal to energy over the ball of phi hat of the Schwartz matrization. So you can reformulate the problem then. The problem becomes problem becomes uh, is it true that uh, the energy over, over omega of phi is greater than the omega of its uh, the energy of its uh, omega symmetrization. That's precisely equivalent. <coughs> well, you can uh, you can pull the same proof. You can do the same proof. Try the same proof. You connect by a geodesic and uh, everything works fine. So only problem is the last step then. Only problem is the last step. I want to find a comparison function. I want phi zero such that, uh, which is a function, not radial now, but a function of u omega, such that uh, the Mont Champer of phi zero is equal to uh, a function of phi zero. That's what I want. I want not a radial function. I could find radial functions that satisfy this. Now I want to find a function which is a function of u omega that satisfies this. Uh, so uh, why can I do this for the ball? Well, it's just because uh, being radial means that you're uh, invariant under mm, the unitary group. But of course for an arbitrary domain there is nothing that corresponds to this. <coughs> and actually you can see that this is really, this works both ways so that uh, the answer is yes if and only if you can find such a function. So the problem is actually equivalent to this. <coughs> the problem is equivalent to uh, a, uh, the existence of such a function. Let me call this then. Uh, let me call this property a star or something like that. So uh, the symmetrization inequality will hold if and only if there is a function of, uh, satisfying this. So the problem is for which domains do we have such a function? Well, I should say the uh, one direction is that you could use the same proof, and the other direction, well, it involves actually. Uh, but let me skip that. So. Uh, it, uh, but it's a, it's a rather short argument saying that the problem is actually equivalent to it. And then the final result is, uh, is this, then the proposition that completes the proof. The proposition is the following. That star holds if and only if uh, omega is an ellipsoid. You can do it if and only if it's an ellipsoid. So let me say why that is true then, to, to, to finish with that. <coughs> the proof of this is the following, that proof u omega is, uh, is log homogeneous. So it means that u of lambda c, since n is a norm, or almost the norm, this is equal to logarithm of lambda plus u omega c. <coughs> it satisfies this. Such functions are in one-to-one -one correspondence uh, uh, to metrics on uh, a line bundle over projective space. So this is uh, the set of all u omega is in one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, with a set of metrics. So, well, there is also pluris harmonic, so the set of positively curved metrics on uh, O1, say, over projective space. So you can reformulate the question here, is there a function of u omega such that, etc., etc., in terms of metrics uh, over there. And then the surprise, well, at first glance, the surprising fact is that, uh, maybe I write it here, 
then so I call this something so so u omega corresponds to phi omega which is a metric on O1 and then you can verify just by rather simple explicit computation that uh, u omega satisfies star if and only if phi well ddc of the metric uh, this is a, a Keller metric on projective space and it's a precisely equivalent to this being Keller Einstein metric it's Keller Einstein this is just a, a, a computation that might look uh, uh, su surprising, but when you write down the formulas, it's not surprising anymore. You see that it's really this equation. And we know precisely which are uh, the Kell Einstein metrics on projective space um, by special case of Mandel Mabuchi theorem. Uh, so it, it implies that <coughs> uh, u omega, well, one case is, of course, logarithm of modulus of c, that's the standard uh, round metric on projective space, and the other ones you get by applying an automorphism of projective space, which is a linear map in homogeneous coordinates, so it looks like this, with, uh, for some uh, linear map. And that then says that omega is an ellipsoid. Says that omega ellipsoid. So that's the uh, end of story. Well, it's, uh, not only biholomorphic, but linear, uh, the linear image of a ball. So it's, the problem is not equivalent under biholomorphic map. So it's a linear image of a ball. So in particular, it's not ellipsoid in the sense of, say, real geometry. No, that could not be, no. no uh, not a real, a complex ellipsoid, yeah, yeah. All right. Yes. Hmm. Well, you, in, in the general case, did you have an estimate of the energy of the synchronization? Yes. Uh, so, uh, so you mean to go back to mosser trudinger inequalities? Uh, uh, no? To your question, if you... If you yeah. Ah, okay, okay. So if you take another one, if you... Uh, that's a reasonable question I get, but I don't know, no. Uh, because the, the method of proof with geodesics is uh, something that it gives all or nothing, I think. <laughs> yes. It's not conceivable that there could be a constant, uh, multiplicative constant. I don't think so, but I, I can see no reason why there should be. I can just say that there is a, you can ask exactly the same problem for convex functions in, o over convex domains in, in Rn. And then there is something like that. And then in order to get a reasonable problem, you have to multiply by constant, a certain constant. And that constant is the Mahler volume of the convex set. Uh, so, so, uh, so then you, uh, there is something in that line, I guess, but I'm, I'm not sure what, what, what happens here. Yeah. So you said the openness conjecture is proved uh, in two dimensions? In two dimensions, yes. Uh, so where is this uh, used? Where is it used? Yes. Uh, you mean applications of that? No, no, no. Uh, I mean the condition on... Uh, Ah, okay, okay. Uh, so how do they use n equal to 2 in the yes. proof? Well, the proof is actually very, very complicated, so it, depend, it depends on... Uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say because I haven't read it in detail, but it, de it depends on a theory that they developed uh, independently, the local, local analysis of singularities of plurisubharmonic functions. So they uh, studied the singularities of plurisubharmonic functions by taking successive blow-ups. And uh, in case somehow, in, in case the plurisubharmonic function is logarithm, if, if the singularities are analytic, so it's the logarithm of some holomorphic map or something, you can blow up so uh, many times and the singularities will disappear. But in, if it's general plurisubharmonic function, you blow up infinitely many, uh, many times. So you get something defined on some abstract space, a la Berkowitz spaces or something like that. And then you. Uh, it, 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 you get an object defined on something called the tree of valuations or something like that. And, and that theory seems to work only for n equal to 2. But it, it, it's not easy. I mean, it's a book. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh. Uh.
So if there aren't any other questions, let's thank Boo again.